Titus uh, chapter 1, and we're looking at uh, biblical leadership today, and then we'll be back in uh, the book of James uh, next week. So um, I'll read the chapter and then we'll, we're looking at chapter 1. Yep. And so we're going to look at what um, biblical leadership is. It says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the knowledge of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which he had committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Saviour. To Titus, my own son, after the common faith, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Saviour. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou should set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city I had appointed thee. And if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accusers of profigency or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the stewards of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, and good and good and not given to wine, not violent, nor given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober-minded, just, holy, and temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught, that he may be able to, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to confute the opposers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped and who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy Lucas sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own set, the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. The testimony is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men, but the truth, but turn from the truth, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their minds and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work. So we're looking at biblical leadership and we're looking at, uh, at that, so I'll just pray. It's always good to pray for God's anointing on the Word. Father, as we come before you today, Lord, we cannot understand this word without the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We can't receive this word without the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Father, we ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you might anoint this message with the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, Father, that we can understand and receive this word, not as the word of man, but as the word of God. And we ask this, Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and for his glory, Amen. Amen. If England, the football match in England, when England's going bad, mm. uh, and it, say the England football team go bad and bad for quite a few months, six months, after a while, they're going to say, we need a new manager. And there comes a new manager, and we've seen a new manager come in, uh, Southgate, and because he's a good leader, he's begin to put things in good place, in a good way. And it shows you that we need good leadership. And whenever there's confusion or difficulty within a team or a group, getting a good leader can help solve the problems. And in this situation, there was a problem in the early church. Throughout the whole early church, throughout the Roman Empire, there were these various groups of heretics. And they, they were spreading like wildfire everywhere. And they even got to Crete. So Paul has to deal with all these confusion, all these heretical teachers spreading everywhere. So what was Paul's way of dealing with it? Basically, appoint good leaders. If we appoint good leaders, then it will stop the infection in the church. And Paul sent a good man to deal with the situation, Titus. Titus was somebody that he could rely upon. If you remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 13 and 15, if we go to that, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, verse 13 and 15, 
Titus is mentioned a few times in, in uh, the Bible as a person. And he was kind of Paul's troubleshooter. Whenever Paul had difficulties, he would send Titus. 2 Corinthians 7, uh, verse 13 and 15. It says, Therefore we were comforted in your comfort, you exceedingly the more joy we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. So Titus is mentioned there, but he's mentioned a few times in the Bible, and often it's in the situation where Paul is using him as a troubleshooter. So he's sending a quality man to Crete, who's going to be used to pick out quality men. So what is biblical leadership? So I, I want people to think that who are watching the video, just for a second, in your own mind, what do you think biblical leadership is? And then, as you think of it, what is the church? What does the church think biblical leadership is? And compare your understanding and the church's understanding, and then we're going to look at what the Bible says. Titus chapter 1, verse 1, is our first biblical leadership, is servant leadership. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul, a servant. Paul saw himself as a servant. So leadership, first and foremost, is servant leadership. When you look at people like in the Navy SEALs, when they're doing the training, the ones who get promoted to sergeant are the ones that not only do their task, but they also help their own fellow teammates. So they've, they've done their own work, but they also make sure that the others can get through. They, they pull the others through. That's real leadership. Servant leadership. Jesus taught about servant leadership. Mark chapter 10, 42. Mark chapter 10, 42. It says in Mark chapter 10, uh, 42, do you want to read, would you like to read it, brother? Just let them know, there's not just me here. Yeah, certainly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Mark, Mark chapter 10. Verse 42, brother. 42. To 45. Yeah. Okay, it's one second. Let's go, 42. It's all right, take your time. But, but Jesus called them to himself and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles Lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so amongst you, but whoever desires to become a great among you shall be a servant. So if we're going to be a leader, if we're going to be a leader in the house of God, or in any ministry, yeah. we've got to be people who have this humility of serving people. And this is very important. So if we go to John chapter 13, in John chapter 13, our Lord is washing the disciples' feet. We won't read all of it, but if you want to do a Bible study, read John chapter 13, 1 to 18. But we'll just read from verse 12. So after he had washed the, their feet and had taken his garment and was seated again, he said unto them, Know you what I have done to you? You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you just do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy if you do them. Amen. That is in the context of the Lord washing the disciples' feet. How humiliated, he's the Lord, the King of the universe, created the whole of the universe, yet he goes to a task in ancient Near Eastern culture, which is a mucky task, cleaning his disciples' feet. And he shows humility. Now, today, in contrast, we're looking for people today who are pushy, who, uh, who, 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 who have a lot to say about themselves. But what the Lord is looking for is people who are willing to serve. When, when we're in a ministry, 
and we're looking to promote people in that ministry, what we should be looking for, first of all, is do they have a heart of leadership? So, for example, if there's a young man or a young woman in the church and you see them giving out hymn books, you see them wanting to clean, and then they come to you a year later and say, oh, we'd like to do youth ministry, you can say, well, go ahead, because you've seen they have a servant heart. But if there's a young man or a young woman and they've just come to the church, they've only been there five minutes, and then they say, I'm, the, I'm God's answer to your church. I can be a great youth leader. And they're only there five minutes. And they're not doing any servanthood. They're not serving anybody. Then you don't touch them with a barge pole. You're looking for hearts that are meek and willing to serve. Those are the ones that are going to be promoted. Because those are the ones that are going to be a blessing to God's house. Because as soon as you promote someone who hasn't got that servant leadership, they become tyrannical. They become... Uh, bossy, they, bec they become dictators in the ministry and they spoil the ministry. So let's look for people that have that servant heart and let's make sure that we have that servant heart. We can't, uh, the thing is, people as pastors and, and in our ministries, we want people to follow us. We say, follow me in the youth ministry, follow me in my pastoral ministry, follow me in this ministry. And you say, follow me. But what you should say is, what can I do for you? How can I serve you? And when we serve people, then when we say as leaders, follow me, they will follow. And very often in leadership, we crack the whip, be there at this time, do this, do that. But if we want people to get to A to B, then we have to show service to them. And it's very uh, frustrating to try to get people to do things in ministry, but we get people to do things in ministry if we show genuine love and servant attitude. And a lot of people can uh, be gifted in ministry, they can be articulate in ministry, they can be doctrinally sound in ministry, but if they've got no love for the people, then there's no point in being in ministry because you've got to have a heart to love people and willing to serve them. That's the heart of being a pastor. That's the heart of being a youth pastor. That's the heart of being in a worship band. That's the heart is saying, I just want to serve you. I want to serve you. I want to show you love. And uh, so many people are in ministry today, and they're doing that ministry, but where's the love for people? Yeah. Yeah. It's loving people. It's caring for people. It's not about you being in that ministry and people looking up to you or... Uh, people admiring you or you've got some kind of name for yourself in that ministry or whatever the first part of call is you have to sit down yourself and say do I love people am I willing to serve them and if you don't have that servant attitude then you need to pray and ask God to give it to you and make sure that we appoint people who are servants so if you go to 1 Peter uh, chapter 5 verse 1 to four. So don't be in a rush to appoint people to leadership. Watch them. See how they see how they conduct themselves. One Peter. One Peter chapter five, verse one to four, and it says this: The elders who are among you, I exhort, whom I am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, feed the flock which is among you, taking the oversight of it, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but for a ready mind. Verse 3 Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being an example to the flock. So we're not to be lords, we're not to be dictators, we're to be servants. That's number one, servant leadership. Secondly, biblical leadership is godly leadership. Godly leadership. Uh, in town in Manchester, there's a bank not far from where I preach. Mm. And... Uh, I put some Nigerian music on, it's very laid back and cool, and you can just listen. And uh, a lot of people come and ask for that music, and one of the men came out of the bank and said, could I have one? I said, well, I've only got one UCB here, but 
Uh, I don't make it for other people, but I'll give it. I'll get you one. Well, <clears throat> for six weeks I was ill with neuralgia. But to be honest, it was a bit of a track because I'm busy and other things to go to the shop, buy a UCB, and then do this yeah. thing. So six weeks later, he sees me, and he's frowning. He's basically. In his frown, he's basically saying, you're not a man of God. You said one thing, but you're not doing it. Yeah. So nine weeks have gone by, and he's still frowning at me, and I haven't got him a UCB. So in the end, I had a backup UCB, and I gave it to him. Mm. And he still wasn't pleased, but I got, I got it to him anyway. But the point is... Sorry about that, I'll just stop that. So the point is, is that my ministry could have been held in disrepute if I didn't fulfill that promise. Yeah. And the world is watching us when we're in leadership, wherever we are, and we have to be careful how we conduct ourselves. In Titus chapter 1, verse 5 and 8, Paul is saying that leaders have to be godly. Verse 5, for this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou should set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had promised, uh, appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of profligacy or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, not violent, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober-minded, just, holy, and temperate. So do you notice, first of all, when Paul is saying you to appoint a leader, look at their character. Mm -hmm. Their character. Now, he says in verse 7, uh, in verse 6, it says, if any, verse 6, if any be blameless, and verse 7, for a bishop must be blameless. So what he's saying is, there mustn't be anything in that life where someone could get a finger in and say, yeah. there's something not quite right there. Because if there is, then what will happen, it will bring disrepute to not only them, but to the ministry, to God's ministry. So we've got to be careful as leaders ourselves, and when appointed leaders, to make sure that we're living a godly life, a, a life that's right. Now we all have issues, we all have problems, we all make mistakes, but we should be looking for people and should be aiming in ourselves to be living a blameless life where people can't stick a finger in and say there's something not quite right there. And uh, so that's what is the, the height of what Paul is setting a very high standard. He says, if any be blameless husband of one wife, so sexual purity, Having faithful, children, uh, having faithful children, if we can't organise our children, then we're not going to be good at organising the church. Mm -hmm. And very often, if the children are unruly and you're in leadership, then it will, it will, it will undermine what you're doing because people will think, well, look, they can't organise their children, but they're trying to organise yeah. the church. Yeah. So just be careful. Um, then he says... For a bishop must be blameless, verse 7, stewards of God, not self-willed, not somebody who's pushy all the time, should be appointed. Because self-willed people end up dominating people, not soon yeah. angry. So we mustn't be blowing our top, we don't want to be putting people in leadership who lose the rag with people. Not given to why, not violent, there were leaders actually slapping people in the church of the time. In other words, there were, they were people who took their leadership and, and lauded it over people. But a lover of hospitality. In the time of Paul, it's not there just like having people around for dinner. It means hospitality there. It means in those days, in the Roman world, there was no hotels. The only things that were were inns, and the inns were like where the prostitutes and the ill repute were. Yeah. So when you were travelling... You didn't really want to go and stay in those places. Yeah. So what the Christian families did, they would put you up. And Christians were known throughout the whole world of being hospitable. 
you could travel and get a, get lodgings in a Christian home. Yeah. And he's saying be hospitable. Uh, lover of hospitality, lover of good men, sober-minded. It's not saying that you walk around like some like unhappy Puritan, because we're to be joyful, but we're to be serious-minded in leadership. Yeah. You know, people who, who want to be clowns in leadership, then go join a circus. But if you're in real leadership, you should be sober-minded. You're you're dealing with uh, you're dealing with holy things, and there must be a gravity about you. Uh, when you're conducting yourself in leadership, whatever that leadership is. So, uh, we'll look at um, a couple of scriptures about leadership. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 12. One Timothy chapter 4 verse 12. It says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. So we're to be an example to people. And um, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 7, it says, This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire a good work. A bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, Temperate, sober-minded, good behaviour, of good behaviour, given to hospitality, and apt to teach. So in conclusion, the church is looking for 95% gifts and 5% character. But the Bible says it's 95% character and 5% gifts. Yeah. Paul is making his emphasis on character first, then gifts. Yeah. And very often we choose people because of their gifting, but does it necessarily mean because they're gifted that they have the character? Yeah. It's the character first. Yeah. And I bought a car, a sports car once, and it looked really, really good on the outside. <laughs> this is a true story. It looked a cracker, it looked like one of these old racing cars, Lamborghini style. It weren't Lamborghini, but it looked like one. It was like a really, it looked really good. Red. Vroom. And this guy told me a load of spiel, and I didn't walk inside, I didn't whatever. I said, right. Yeah. So I got it at a cheap deal for you, yeah. I drove it all the way to Cornwall, and came back, and I took it in for an MOT. Yeah. And the garage said, what are you driving this for? It's a death trap. It's a death trap. It looked good on the outside, but underneath it, was, it wasn't good. Yeah. And leadership is a death trap if our character isn't right. Because when the wheels fall off, not only do we cause a mess for ourselves, we call a mess for the church. So it's important... Sorry about this. It's important that we focus on character. people are falling this morning. It's important we focus on character. It's very easy in ministry um, to have a double life. Yeah. Because you can be busy and as you're busy uh, and doing lots of things, it's at night when in, you can get into your own little world. It's, that's your little quiet time and that's the area where you can start to make mistakes and drift off. Yeah. You know, there was one conference, a pastor's conference, and I said this for the pastors, but for all of us, that um, it was in America, there was thousands of pastors there in this hotel, and the porn gauge for the television went up and up and up mm. while the pastor's conference. Mm. So in other words, they were all watching it. Yeah, yeah. So, character. Uh, as leaders, we've got to be straight with each other and right with each other and right with God and um, make sure that we have a right character. If we have issues in our ministry, we need to talk with other pastors yeah. and be open and accountable and make sure anything that's not right is dealt with and uh, so, we're, so we have that, that character. And we shouldn't appoint people 
who don't demonstrate a, a, a semblance of, of good character. So that's the first thing is um, servant leadership and second thing godly character. And thirdly and finally doctrinally soundness. Imagine you're a general of the British Army and you want an officer to take some of your troops, special forces, over to Iraq to rescue some British tourists. And you're, you're going to promote someone to do this, but you give them an opportunity for, for the interview. So three officers come. The first officer comes in and dresses as a clown. And cracks jolts and has a laugh. And, and then the other two come very serious, serious-minded. Who are you going to appoint? You're going to appoint the serious-minded. You see that it's a very serious task. Yeah. And yet the church is looking for leaders that are entertainers and not seriously minded about being sound in doctrine and teaching the word of God. Yeah. And in Titus chapter 1 verse 9 and 11, Paul says about teachers of the word, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able, here it is, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to confute the opposers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy Lucas' sake. So, if you've got a cancer in your arm, you've got you've to get that cancer out, you've got to cut it out. And when there's things that are taught in the churches that are heretical, the way to cut it out is to have people who are sound Bible teachers that can teach what's right, and that deals with the cancer of heretical teaching. Yeah. And it's God's will and it's God's biblical model that those who are appointed to leadership must be people who are sound in doctrine and in the word. So for example, most pastors this day, and I'm not exaggerating, don't study theology, they don't study biblical theology, they don't study their Bible all the time. Many of them, if you do research, many of them will get their messages off the internet. Yeah. Or many of them see themselves as managers of the church. They're managers. I'm managing the church. No, no. No pastor should be in the ministry unless that pastor is sound in doctrine and wants to teach sound doctrine. You shouldn't be in ministry if you don't want to do that. Because no pastor has a right to just be a manager. You are there to be a teacher of the word. Amen. Titus 2 verse 1, But speak thou the things which become what? Sound doctrine. Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, it says, uh, verse 2, it says, preach the word, it doesn't say entertain, it doesn't say manage, it says preach the word, be diligent, in season, out of season, repute, rebuke, exhort, in long suffering, and doctrine. Yeah. 1 Timothy chapter 1, Verse 3, it says, uh, is it 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, I think? So, oh, yeah. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. I besought thee to abide still in Ephesus, and when I come into Macedonia, that thou mightst charge some that they teach no other doctrine. And so, sound doctrine, sound teaching. Those in leadership should be reading the word, studying the word. John MacArthur, who expounds the Bible, spends, spends, I think it's nearly at least 30 hours a week. I think it's more than 30 hours a week. In the word. If you, if you actually find out more, I think it's more than 30 hours. I think it's like 40 hours a week. Yeah. But just on the safe side, 30 hours. So he's 30 hours studying the word to produce the Bible, the Bible teaching. Campbell J. Morgan, an old Bible teacher, before he preached on a book of the Bible, 
chapter by chapter. He would read that book 40 times before he preached on it. So people have to be, if you're a youth worker, if you are in any kind of leadership, you're there to teach the Bible. Yeah. You're there to teach the Bible. If a plane in, uh, in, in the Manchester airport flew, flew into Manchester airport and suddenly terrorists took it over, <clears throat> we send the SAS in, the SAS to go in and to, to take them out. Those who are appointed to leadership are the SAS. They're the SAS to defend the faith. Mm. To defend the faith. And they have to be sound Bible teachers. 2 Timothy 